Hey guys, good morning and welcome to Mercy Online. I'm your host, Jessica Murray, Communications Coordinator right here at Mercy Church. And today I'm joined by... Alan Orohio, the resident church planter here at Mercy. Welcome to Mercy Online, second Sunday of 2022. I don't know about you, oh, but I'm feeling 2022. 2022 How many times again? have you guys heard that? <laughs> Everywhere. Everyone's saying it. It is but I love so it. good. I love this year. Yeah, it already? Perf- yeah, I love it. It's been the best year already. It's been the best year already. <laughs> <laughs> it has been a good year already. We've already had... A great sermon on yes. Psalm 46. Psalm 46. We're in our Knowing God series. The Lord is my refuge. And my strength. Ooh, a very present help. In a time of trouble. Come on. Yeah, let's go. Yes. Okay, out there. Have no. you been practicing the five minutes of uh, just silence and I being have. still? Yeah. So if you guys weren't with us last Sunday, what Alan's referencing is Pastor Spence actually challenged us from stage. Yes. Every day to just set a timer for five minutes and practice listening prayer. And yeah, I've actually done it. Uh, I missed a day, but I did it every other day. And so refreshing. So cool. Like yeah. just stealing yourself before the Lord and seeing what he has for At you. first is like the first one minute. It's like, I'm supposed to be doing something right now. Yeah. You have to like, <laughs> like in your mind, be yeah. like, it's okay. I got to stop doing stuff. Like just got to <laughs> sit here. But yeah. If this is your first time gathering with us, welcome. We love that you're here with us. We, we would do. love to get to know your name, where you are gathering with us from. So would you please go ahead and put your name in on the chat. chat. Dro- drop, drop it, it in, in the chat. chat. Drop oh, it, no, drop we're it. out of practice. We're out of we practice. Gotta do it again. We Ready? Gotta do it. Ready? One, two, go. Drop, drop it in, in the, the chat. chat. Drop, drop, drop it in the chat. chat. I love that we'll I say better. one, two, go. <laughs> yes. Oh, but we really would love to know if you're watching from Canada yes. or Kenya or Europe. Oh, or Roxboro. Or Roxboro. Shout out. If you're watching from Roxboro, you probably know me. So, you know, definitely put your name in the chat. We'll talk later. <laughs> so we started a new series. We're in the Psalms. We are. So knowing God, yeah. we've actually done this series before. Oh, so this is the third time round. I think it's the it's third or fourth. Okay. Yeah, because we've done a few installments of this sermon series. But basically, we take a psalm, we look through it, we reflect together, and we have an action step like throughout the week of what we can do with this psalm. So it's a really cool series. And so if you're new around here, it's a really cool time yeah. to just be getting involved and getting into the life of mercy. So, yeah, yeah. we would love to tell you guys what it's going to be like this morning. I'm going to let Alan do that before we actually get into the service. You want to oh, give yes. him a run so through? So what we're going to do, and this is what we do always, is we have a time in worship, in music, mm-hmm. and then we continue worshiping through listening actively to the sermon and then some more music. And then we come back and give you all the information you need to know about what's going on in the life of mercy. Yep. So stick around. We have so much info uh, for DMT, uh, Mercy Nairobi Vision Night. So right after the worship at the end of the service, we're going to tell you all that. So right now, what we want you to do, and we are going to join you in this, Absolutely. is worship our Lord, okay? So you're home, you're relaxed, you got your coffee, you got your tea, maybe you got your hot chocolate, whatever it is you're drinking. <laughs> if you have like cold tea, that's okay. That's all right. That's okay. uh, we want you to, we would we'll encourage you to put that down now. Yeah. And <laughs> let's praise the Lord. Hands up. Let's worship the Lord. There is promise in the promise in the Lord. He is true to every word that He speaks to us. There is promise in the Lord our God. Sing there is healing.
could shout for that. There is victory in the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. He has conquered death and sin. We are conquerors with Him. There is victory in the Lord our God. Oh, you are good. You are great. You are not subject to change. You are good. You are great. Yesterday, today, the same. Author of all existence, source of all blessedness, I adore thee for making me capable of knowing thee. For giving me reason and conscience, for leading me to desire thee. I praise thee for the revelation of thyself in the gospel. For thy heart is a dwelling place of pity. For thy thoughts of peace towards me. For thy patience and thy graciousness, for the vastness of thy mercy. Thou hast moved my conscience to know how the guilty can be pardoned, the unholy sanctified, and the poor enriched. May I be always amongst those, who not only hear, but know thee, who walk with and rejoice in thee, who take thee at thy word and find life. family. Good morning. Hey, uh, we're going to be in Psalm chapter 8. Uh, a couple of things while you're working your way over there as we continue our Knowing God series. I want to give you a couple of updates uh, in our church. Uh, the first one, I uh, want to update you on Advent giving. Um, our church tries to practice what we preach when it comes to our money. And since we preach uh, from the scriptures that we ought to give 10% a tithe back to the Lord and thankfulness for what he's done for us. We try and do that as a church uh, with everything that we bring in. We try to give it away to God's mission in the world outside our doors. But this past Christmas season, we decided to bump that from 10% to 33% or to a third of everything that we got in. And we we're going to direct it to international missions work. Now, we're of course not going to pull anything away from uh, our work here in Charlotte and our partners in Charlotte. So really, we gave away like 40% of what we brought in last month. Um, but y'all, let me tell you what happened in our Advent giving, just kind of update you on it. And for comparison's sake, Christmas of 2020, we took up a Christmas missions offering. You guys were super generous. It was our biggest one ever. And we gave $80,000 in 2020, all right? Um, this past Advent, um, through the uh, generosity of this church, it was our second largest giving month in our six and a half year history. Uh, because of that, our one-third gift to international missions was $130,000 that we're able to give to the advancement of the gospel. Praise the Lord for that. Oh, so cool. Hey, um, speaking of just international work and what we believe the Lord's called us to, to send God's people to 
all people. We do have a vision night for Mercy Nairobi uh, coming up this coming Saturday. It's our first international church plant. Uh, you guys, I hope you know him, Alan Warohio. He and his family are taking a team, and they're going to be going and planting Mercy Nairobi. Uh, this is a big deal for us. It's this year, and so this, um, this thing, this Saturday night, I hope you'll come if you're able to. Now, uh, I do want to acknowledge one other thing, and that's that we kind of had a little bit of a surprise yesterday. Our Mercy Northeast campus, uh, the power went totally out at the facility, and they're not able to meet there. So they're meeting. Some of them are coming and visiting here at Providence Road, and others are gathering with their community group there. So guys, we love you, and we will be glad to gather again next week. Um, but we see you, know you're there. Thanks for being so flexible with us in this uh, Crazy time, crazy time. Um, all right, so knowing God, uh, knowing God, this series in the Psalms, our purpose is super simple, guys. We want to know God. <laughs> God is a person we are meant to know. He's not just a bunch of information we're meant to know about and just learn. He's not an abstract force. He's not just a divine rule maker. We're meant to not just know about him, we're meant to know him. And usually that gap right there between knowing about him and knowing him is the gap people experience in their faith. They know information, but it's not leading anywhere to any kind of life change because they don't have a relationship with God. And you were created not just for information about God, but for relationship with God. So this month, we're trying to make that shift from not just having a faith that's primarily information, but moving to a faith that is activated and empowered through a relationship with God. And the Psalms give us words for this. And what I love about Psalm 8, y'all, written so long ago, is that it gives a really powerful, better word to our present day quest for what the world around us, pop culture, would call self-worth. The older word would be self-esteem, right? That was the word that David Hume introduced in the 18th century. The Scottish philosopher, he brought it in as self-esteem to say, this is the kind of value that you ascribe to yourself. And with each generation, this perspective has risen in importance. This how much you value your spouse, yourself, especially in our Western and the Western world, which is highly individualistic already, right? We're already focused on ourselves very different than an Eastern culture. That's more group centric. We are individual centric and all the more has this need risen and risen. In fact, the present day call for valuing yourself is as loud as it's ever been. Mantras like be proud of who you are. There's whole groups that are trying to flip the world on its head so that we are free to be us. I'm free to be me. I am enough. The world is so loud with this right now that it's even saying, listen, it's changing the whole definition of truth to truth is what is true to you. And whatever's true to you, that is what is true. That's how loud the call is for some sense of self-worth. And here's the problem as the call for self-worth is at an all-time high so is the craving for it. More self-help books than ever before. More time on screen scrolling for encouragement than ever before. More life coaches, more movements to join and join up with others to find that sense of self-worth. And yet, our actual sense of it, of self-worth, has never been lower. We're all more fragile than ever before. That's why we're also much more easily offended than ever before. Because we're fragile. We're not confident in who we are. So we either fight or we run. I mean, I don't know, God, don't you feel this? I feel like everybody just needs a hug right now. When I look around and watch the way that people work, our collective history with self-worth is showing that the more we try to validate ourselves, the more insecure we're becoming. It's like we're drinking salt water. The more we drink the words of self-worth that the world has to offer, the thirstier we get. It doesn't quench our thirst. It dries us out. But here's the deal, y'all. The truth is, the human heart was made to search for and find self-worth. It is a built-in need. You are not crazy. You're not wrong in this desire you have to be loved and valued. But if nothing in this world satisfies that desire, we got to look beyond it. In fact, C.S. Lewis said this so well in his book, Mere Christianity. It's one of my favorites. You've heard me reference it before if you've been around our church for a little while. He said, if I find in myself, in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. That's what Psalm 8 is going to explore today. 
It's going to show us a soul-satisfying, soul-uplifting perspective on self-worth. And I'll go ahead and tell you uh, what that perspective is, how this thing's going to go, because you might get a little offended at the beginning of the psalm, all right? Because the psalm is going to tell you to look up, to get lost in the greatness of God, and then after that, it's going to spend most of its verses telling you how that great God loves you, cares for you, and has a purpose for you, how he values you and has a purpose for you. That God has better words for you than anything in this world does. Words that can quench your thirst. It'll be like fresh water for our souls, but you got to let it unfold. And then I think you're going to be really encouraged. So the title for today's sermon, which I don't always give you titles, but I just felt like I wanted to give you one. It's like a, a big main thought for today is finding self-worth in the greatness of God. The Psalm is going to show us that the way to a satisfied heart a satisfied heart that no longer needs the praise of people, that no longer needs the search. And if you do not actually desire the praise of people, you're lying right now, okay? And you've got to deal with that, all right? A different psalm. But the way to get to that spot where you no longer crave it is actually to take our eyes off ourselves and fix them on the greatness of God and as we are awed by who he is, captivated by the greatness of God, that great God speaks words back to us. It's amazing. And as he speaks back to us, our souls are finally satisfied. He speaks value. purpose. It's awesome. There's only nine verses. I have no idea how we're going to get through it in our sermon time allotted for today, okay? Because uh, it's so good. But we're going to do our best. Finding a better identity in the greatness of God. Here we go. Verse 1. This is the psalmist David. King David, David went through some stuff, and he says, Lord, our Lord, this is to be remembered together, how magnificent is your name throughout the earth. You have covered the heavens with your majesty. The first step in seeing yourself rightly is seeing God rightly. You see that. Verse 1, there's nothing about you anywhere. That's very, very good for us. The very best thing for our self-image is first forgetting about ourselves altogether and being wholly captivated by God. To get a better, so maybe a little turn of phrase, to get a better self-image, we need a better God image, right? Now, I told you we're going to get to what he says about us, but there's great freedom in forgetting about yourself. Listen, the first step is to discovering the self-worth that God has designed for you is to celebrate the magnificent universe covering majesty of God. Lord, our Lord. It's actually the, even that little section there right at the beginning. That's not repetitive. In Hebrew, those are two different words. The first is Yahweh. The one with, that's the one with all caps in your Bible, if you got that. It's a translation of the name Yahweh, not the generic one for God, but the personal name of Israel's God built on that statement in Exodus. I am, Exodus 3.14, I am who I am. God named himself Yahweh. He's the absolute existing one. The one who simply is, he didn't come into being, he's not going out of being, he never changes in his being, he is absolute. He depends on nothing, and all else depends on him. That's our Lord. And that's the point of the psalm. The psalm begins and ends with the same thing, praising the God who is magnificent. There is no place on earth, he covers the earth, right? No place on earth where God is not the I am. He's the God over UNC Charlotte, he's the God over Uptown. He's the God over Waxhaw and Weddington and Matthews and Gastonia. He is majestic in his reign over your home, over your bed. And at the same time, he is majestic in his reign over Jerusalem, over Mecca, over the Alps and the Himalayas. Over His greatness reigns over the Great Wall of China. It reigns over the streets of Nairobi and in the remote, most remote corner of the frozen tundra of Russia. He's more beautiful and powerful than all things everywhere in the earth. In the heavens, David is saying, the stars, the galaxies, all that, there's canvas. Y'all, there is canvas, and he's painting his majesty upon them. Which is why, listen to me, you're going to find a lot more awe and wonder looking at the stars than you do looking at a mirror. Because it is better for your soul to be reminded of the greatness of God before ever even considering yourself. He's magnificent. And the aim of the psalm is to lift your eyes up off of yourself and to worship God. 
connection to last week in Psalm 46. Be still. Be still and just know that I'm God. That starts with, Lord, our Lord, how magnificent is your name in all the earth. You want to experience the fullness of knowing God. Take your eyes off yourself. There's freedom there. Uh, Tim Keller wrote a book, The Freedom of Self-Forgetfulness. Right? I love it. Tiny little things you should go read if you want more on this. But just there's a lot of freedom in totally forgetting about yourself. Be still and worship. And then the psalm takes what to me feels like a strange turn. Verse 2. Took me a while to figure this one out. As much as one can figure out the mysteries that is the scriptures. Okay? So this is my best guess here. From the mouths of infants and nursing babies, you've established a stronghold on account of your adversaries in order to silence the enemy and the avenger. Now, what do we do with this? The rest of the psalm is about us and God. But then there's verse 2. What are we to make of the mouths of infants and nursing babies? God brings victory. That's that you've established a stronghold. He brings victory over the devil, that's his enemy, through the mouths of small children. Well, first off, let's acknowledge if God really is the universe painting into the sky, you know, this all-powerful, eternal I am, if that's really who he is, he ain't threatened by any enemy. Not at all. And so he can defeat those enemies, even the devil himself, however he pleases. All right, these are not threats to him. And so he chooses, how's he going to choose to have this victory? Not through the strong, but through the weak. The weak will be the instruments of his victory. The mouths of infants and nursing babes. The mouths, mouths who can't even really speak. They just babble, right? And through the weakest of humans, God establishes victory over our greatest enemy. That's a really important reminder that it's one of those threads that if you were to chase it, it runs all the way throughout scripture. He always seems to bring victory through the weak, through the youngest, through the smallest, through the outsider. It shouldn't surprise us that he came to earth himself, not as a warrior, but as a baby. Why? First Corinthians 1 27. He has chosen what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God has chosen what is weak in the world to shame the strong. In fact, Jesus, oh, this is so great. Jesus comes along and actually gives us full, clear meaning for Psalm 8. Y'all, Bible reading 101. I, I've told you my hope that my like, ministry here at Mercy Church is just to get everybody reading their Bible. All right, then I will have been successful as your pastor. And Bible reading 101 is wherever possible, let the Bible interpret the Bible for you. All right, this is one of those Psalms, okay? Jesus is going to interpret it for us, making my job in one sense really easy and another sense really hard. All right, Psalm 8, he talks about it in Matthew 21, and here's what he says. Well, first, Matthew sets everything up. Matthew says, The blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he, Jesus, healed them. And then the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonders that he did. And they saw children shouting in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David. And they were indignant, these chief priests. And they said to him, do you hear what these children are saying? And Jesus says, yes. Have you never read? Which is a slight by the way, too cheap. That's like talking to the pa Have you ever read in the Bible, pastor? You know, so have you never read in the Bible? Priests, you have prepared praise from the mouths of infants and nursing babies. Why did the priests become indignant? Because they were sitting there thinking, these children, can you believe what these children are saying? They're saying that you're the Messiah. Aren't you going to rebuke them? He, they're calling you by this holy title. And Jesus says, of course they are. Because God uses the foolish to shame the wise. The weak to shame the strong. And as Jesus quotes Psalm 8, verse 2, he simultaneously fulfills it. But notice, he, he quotes it slightly different. Will you nerd out with me for a second on this? It's so good, all right? He, the way he says it, he says you have prepared praise, which is actually the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. We're not going to go too far into that kind of stuff, okay? He does that, though. He says prepared praise instead of established stronghold to show how it's being fulfilled. Psalm 8.2 doesn't tell us how the babies use their mouths to establish strength and silence the enemy. It just says out of the mouths. But this, what Jesus says in, his, in this translation, cites a, it answers the question of how these children use their mouths to silence the enemy. They praise God. That's how they silence the enemy. That's how, that's the people, the tiny, the weakest of the weak humans 
That is how God uses them to silence the stronghold of the enemy and to establish a stronghold over that enemy. It's through praise. It's not the only time in the Old Testament where the praises of God's people was the power that defeated the enemies of God. And y'all, some of y'all just need to grab hold of that today, that instead of the strength and you're going to tough it out in the stuff that you're dealing with, actually the strongest thing that you can do in that battle, praise God. And which is an incredibly weak and vulnerable position. You lift your hands up, right? You think even just the posture of praise in the Psalms, you're lifting your hands up, you're fully vulnerable there. And as you give out praise, the only thing we do in the world where as we give away, we get so much more. We get filled up and we get strengthened through it. Y'all, God achieves victory over his enemies through the weak things of the world, especially praise. And what you and I need to take away here in this little aside first is how counterproductive it is to get to wrap your self-worth up in your own strengths. Because God doesn't use that. He doesn't use the strong. <laughs> so let this be, I hope it's for you what it was for me this week. You can just take a breath and calm down a little bit. <laughs> All right? And know that you don't have to prove yourself to find worth. He's going to use the weak. Man. You don't have to prove yourself. For Spence it was. Doesn't matter how many people come to church. Doesn't matter how many people or on the internet, watching church, or in the programs, or all the giving, and blah, 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 blah. That's Spence's finding identity in work. Doesn't have to be that way anymore. Right? I can rest because he has already told me where I find my identity, and the same is true for you. And second, you can see the majesty of God in the heavens. It also has a face and a name. It's Jesus. He's the object of our praise. He silences his enemies with the voices of weak children. He will have his victory through an apparent weakness, death on the cross, which will actually be a magnificent show of strength if only we can see it. And you and I, weak people, can be set free from trying to build our lives in our own strength. We can rest, rest in his strength, and we'll be ready for the next step in finding this true fulfilling self-worth. Look at verse three. When I observe your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you set in place. Here we are still looking up like we were in verse one. We're still looking up. I still seeing the canvas of God's majesty. God made the universe with his fingers, not even with his like arm. He didn't use the bicep to make the whole universe, right? Just tinkering around. He did it. I was trying to think of how we like get our minds around this. Like you think of we're in the, what's called the Milky Way galaxy, right? Uh, best thing I could find on this is if the Milky Way galaxy, if you can look in your mind's eye at like a picture of the map of the world, the Milky Way galaxy being like North America in size, if that were true, then our solar system will be the size of a cup in North America. Okay. Tiny little thing. Earth is a speck of dust on that cup. And you and I are like, I don't even know, like tiny little micro dust particles or something like that on there. All right, we are very, very small. The universe, very large, yet tiny to God. And what are we in that? You see how small we are? How temporary we are? And then verse four, what is a human being? Look at all this. What is a human being that you remember him? A son of man that you look after him. We are meant to be a little surprised in light of how majestic and awesome, if we would really see God rightly, We'd be a little surprised that he would even remember us. How incredible, not only that you remember us, that you look after. That's saying that you care. You care about little fragile humans. These little fragile micro dust particles that often neglect and reject you. And even though we do, we still, we desperately need you and you care for us. You don't just remember us, you look after us. Don't miss the connection starting to unfold between you and God. We're staring up into the heavens in awe of this great God. Tiny little specks of dust. Not only has he thought of us, he provides for us, he cares for us, values us. That's where you start to find self-worth. The God of the universe. And we start to see that God rightly, majestic, magnificent. Looks down at you, individual human being, little old, messed up, super fragile, trying to keep her life together with duct tape and a prayer, and says, 
I see you. I see you and I care for you and I love you and I'm going to look after you. God has chosen to direct his universe creating and sustaining power towards looking after you. (laughs) That's insane. And it's deeply life-giving because you could never give yourself that kind of worth. You can't give that to yourself. You're not God. God has the greater capacity to ascribe worth than mere mortals ever could, and he looks after you. Start to catch the power of letting God set the terms of your self-worth. That's what we're heading towards here. And, and how do you do that? We well, believe that God sees you. So one of the things I just want somebody to walk away with, like the only point you need to grab hold of and walk away with, you need to write it into your Bible, you need to write it all in your mirror and point the arrow to go outside. God sees you. Actively, right now, he sees you. And in the quiet, still moments where you're all alone, he sees you. He says you're never alone. He sees you. He loves you. By the way, if you are living a double life where you're rebelling against God in secret but pretending to worship God in public, he sees that too. That should sober you up. should bring you to repentance. And you'll find value in that God sees you even in all your sin and still loves you and still offers you forgiveness. So you can stop fighting, stop hiding, and you can come home. Gospel is so good. It's so good. It's crazy to me. We can't receive the forgiveness that God has already offered in Christ until we repent of the sins that He already sees. Out of everything He created, He chose to single us out and give us special significance and purpose in His creation. And look what He says about us. Verse 5 You made Him little less than God and crowned Him with glory and honor. Now, not surprisingly, I'll tell you how this sermon ends, how the psalm ends, and how the New Testament talks about it. It's going to end talking about Jesus, okay? But it does, in Christ, give value and purpose to each of us. There are two very important things about your self-worth just in that verse. You were created in the image of God, crowned with glory and honor. That's David taking Genesis 1.27 and putting words to it and making a song out of it. That's what the psalms are. There are these lyrical prayers, these songs that he sings back to God. God has crowned you with glory and honor as his image bearer. Glory and honor. Those are words reserved for God in the Psalms. And as his image bearer, he extends it to you and I. He extends a reflection of his majesty onto us. We are lesser in measure than him. Yes, of course. But somehow he has put glory and honor on us. Just us speck of dust, micro dust, earthlings. There's an echo. What's happening in that? There's an echo of heaven reverberating in each one of us. A desire for eternity on our hearts because we are created by an eternal God in his image. And I pause here, y'all, because you could scour every self-help book, every episode Oprah ever made, every silly Insta post about being a boss girl, and nothing is going to come close to Psalm 8.5. God gives you glory and honor. What can touch that? Nothing can touch that. (laughs) You can fail at everything in your life and you can't touch it. Like you can fail at grades, relationships, job, friendship. You can even have hobbies and be bad at them. Okay? And you know what? You cannot fail out of his sight. And you cannot fail out of of the glory and honor that he has given you as his creation. That should, at the same time, that should humble you and empower you. Humble you, (laughs) you had nothing to do with it. So it should humble you, but it should also empower you because divine glory and honor are with you. So when you're tempted to, some of y'all are tempted to loathe yourself. You can't stand yourself. Teenagers, let me talk to you for a second. When you are tempted to put your head down, frustrated at yourself, the answer is not to look down. (laughs) It's also not to look at a screen, hoping like halfway up, hoping you'll find approval there. When you get down on yourself, then the world comes around and says, hey, pick your head up. 
Okay. Psalm 8 is saying, go outside and pick your head all the way up. All the way up. And by the way, if you can't do that because you feel like I got nothing left, I'm just going to keep looking down. Psalm 139, where can I go that I can outrun the presence of God, that I can flee your spirit? If I go to the highest heavens, you're there. If I go down to Sheol, oh, there you are again. So for those of you that can't lift your head up, just look down. He's there too. How good is our God? The world's got nothing on that. The one who painted the heavens, the one who went down into Sheol, into the grave for you. He sees you. He gives you your worth. That's all you need. I know we are fragile. All right. Even the strongest of us are fragile. And one, just one word when spoken to us, especially by someone who's like uh, an influence, an influencing voice, not an influencer, an influencing voice on our life. All right. You know what I mean? Like a dad, a mom, a, a close friend, a boss, somebody like that, who says something like, you're lazy, man, you're, you're just useless. You're just blah, blah, blah. Those things stick to us like labels, don't they? That's why the sky is always there. You can always go outside and look up. It's reminding you that that God is always there. And his label is the size of the universe. And he says you're glorious. So get wrapped up in, in that. Pick your head up and here's what you do. Psalm 8, verse 6 through 8. The psalmist says, who is this human? You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet. All the sheep and oxen, as well as the animals in the wild, and the birds of the sky and the fish of the sea that pass through the currents of the seas. <laughs> and now he gives us, he has given us value and now purpose. We're made to rule over his creation. There's your purpose. God looked at you, gave you his image and the dignity that comes with it. And then he said, care for my creation. Get to work. And by the way, this is Genesis 1 again. Be fruitful and multiply, rule over the earth and subdue it, fill the earth and subdue it, cultivate it. This is showing off the glory of God. He established victory over the enemy through the weakness of his children, and now he's ruling creation through the weakness of mankind. God made you like him, which means he has given you capacity to bring good out of the earth and into the world. To rule, is to, it's to build and to cultivate. There's a whole sermon series right there on how to think about your work. But suffice it to say, Ephesians 2.10 says that God created you, and from the foundations of the earth, he created you for good works to walk in. Which means you weren't meant to sit around. You were made to work. But whatever work you do, it's purpose, whether it's school, whether it's, man, whether it is your hobbies that you normally fail at, Whatever it is that you are doing, the purpose is to bring glory and honor to him. That's Colossians 3, 23. Whatever you do, do it from the heart as something done for the Lord, not for people. Oh, man, this gets me. This gets me through a lot. What's my motivation behind what I'm doing, behind my work, behind my relationships and how I'm acting in them? Am I trying to please an audience of one or an audience of many? So you can walk into your work, your schoolwork, your job search, walk into it tomorrow, and say, God, help me to just glorify you today. And there, in that, and in that work there, that's where you'll find renewed self-purpose. But here's the deal. Even as you do that, and as you go, with all of this value as an image bearer of God, that God, and all that value and a purpose that he is with you in as you go into it, you're still going to fail. Be encouraged, Mercy Church. No, I'm just saying, like, it's just a reality, all right? So I don't want to give you a, a false reality there. You're still going to mess up. You're still going to have bad days on the job and, and everything like that. Right? You're still going to have tough days. You're going to struggle. You're going to try to exalt yourself. You're going to try to run after your own desires. You're going to sin against God, which is why now with our last little bit, we need the greater meaning of this psalm. So like I said, several places in the New Testament cite this psalm, but Hebrews 2 gives us the fullest treatment of it, I think. It quotes this psalm, and it says that the he is actually Jesus in this. Here's the way um, the Apostle Paul starts it. I'm going to start in verse 6. He says, 
But someone somewhere has testified, which I love when Paul's just like, he knows where. What is man that you remember him or the son of man that you care for him? You made him little lower than the angels for a short time. You crowned him with glory and honor and subjected everything under his feet. You see what he's doing? He's quoting Psalm 8. And then he explains it. For in subjecting everything to him, that's Jesus, he left nothing that is not subject to him. As it is, we do not yet see everything subjected to him, but we do see Jesus, made lower than the angels for a short time, so that by God's grace, he might taste death for everyone. Crowned with glory and honor, this Jesus, because he suffered death. He was crowned with a crown of thorns, foolish and weak to the eyes of the world, but a crown of glory and honor according to God, because this was the one who at that very moment was defeating the curse of sin over us. And you and I are to see ourselves in this psalm, and it should encourage us to know how big God is, and that big God sees us, cares for us, and has a purpose for us. And then in this greater meaning, We see that it's about Christ. And if we're in Christ, everything he says in Psalm 8, he says to you in Christ. He says you have approval, not because now that you understand what you're supposed to do, now you do it perfectly. Now you do it pretty well. No, 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 no. You don't have approval because of that. Not because of what you do, but because of what Christ has done. You have glory and honor because of Christ. And your identity, man, your identity is in him. It says you are clothed, you are covered by Christ. And when God looks at you, he sees Christ. And his judgment on you, he hands to Christ and reconciles you back to himself. And our hearts should be overflowing in worship because of it. Because we see God's love for us. He tasted death for everyone. <laughs> he took our death. That's what it's saying there. Tasted death for everyone. He drank it to the dregs. He didn't just sip it. He took it all and offered us life purpose, and eternal union with God. And when you catch that, Christian, which is why we as Christians need to grab hold of the Psalms, because man, they have so much meaning for us on this side of the cross. You grab hold of that. That God has given you glory and honor. And then that God has given you purpose in your life to walk out and to bring him glory and honor in your friendships, relationships, and everything else. That God has reconciled you and not given you the payment for your sin that you deserved. He put it on Christ and has reconciled you back to himself. That God promises you eternal union with him in heaven. That God. Now we look back at verse 9. And man, it should ring all the more deeper, this echo from verse 1. Lord, our Lord, how magnificent is your name through all the earth. (laughs) Same words, but they should reverberate all the deeper in our hearts because of who he is and what he's done for us. And that, y'all, that's where self-worth is. I can have all of that in my morning time with God before I ever walk into whatever the day has for me. (sighs) There's nothing So I'm about to do Romans 8. I can't do it because we ain't got time for it. But I could get into that and you should go read it. All right? There's nothing that can separate you from that love, from that grace, from that kindness. Which is why, you know, the action step. I told you each week, I want to give you an action step. This past week, I was really encouraged, by the way, that you guys took it with the, uh, the action step of five minutes of listening prayer each day where you just sit still before God. And like the child Samuel, you say, speak to me, Lord, I'm listening. Just listen to God. If you didn't do that, I would encourage you to do that. And maybe you need to hang on to that. But I want to add a prayer to your morning, which is God, show me how to live for your glory today. I'm watching. I'm not just listening. I'm watching. Because I want to live for your glory because my self-worth is in who you say that I am. It's in you and who you say that I am. So I want to live for your glory today. So show me, God, I'm watching. Last week was I'm listening This week, Lord, show me how to live for your glory because I'm watching. Let me close this in just a time of prayer and response. If you would, bow your head and get into a posture of prayer before this great and awesome God. And I just want you to respond to him. It's the greatest thing in the world. It doesn't just, (laughs) 
He knows you. He knows the number of hairs on your head. He knows everything about you. He sees you, like the psalm said, like we said. He sees you. He looks after you. So with, with that in mind, would you just thank him that this great God sees you and he loves you? Thank him for that. He loves you. Thank you for your love, God. If you've got a burden that you're carrying, something that's feeling heavy in your life, tell him. He loves you. He looks after you. And he calls you to cast that onto him. He can carry it. It's something you've been praying for for a while and you're tired of praying for it. Well, give it to him and let him be the strong one, not you. Let him carry it. If you've never given your life to Christ, say, I want this. I want to know that God. Now you can do that right now, your prayer. God, I believe. You tell him, I believe that I'm a sinner. I believe I need. I need the saving forgiveness that Christ offered me on the cross when he stood and hung in my place. So I receive your forgiveness today. I believe that you are real, you're God. I believe he got up out of the grave. Thank you, God, for saving me. You, you tell him, maybe the last part of this prayer, you might need me to list out what you're, what are you getting into this week? God, in my work, in my family, whatever else, my friendship, my room, with my roommates, in my classes, whatever else it is, help me to live for your glory. Show me what it means to live for your glory. I'm watching. I'm watching. God, thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace on <laughs> tiny little us. You have ascribed so much worth and value onto us, way more than anything this world could ever offer us. So Father, I pray that we would rest in that, that we would find renewal and strength and joy in that. God, thank you. May that be the, the response of hearts that see you rightly. It's wow. And thank you. And we love you, Father. Thank you for our time to consider your majesty. How great, how great and magnificent is your name through all of you. Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. But do you wish that you could see?
If you're new around here, I think this is my catchphrase. Yes. You thought I was going to say I it. I thought you were going to say it. I'm just it. messing him up. Yep. I, I love, love worshiping with our Mercy Church. Church. Oh, okay. Uh, switching okay. it up now on him. Just, okay, I yes. see how you do it. No, I really do love worshiping with our church. Yeah. And if you want even more like experience of worshiping with us, you can actually find our playlist on Spotify. Yes. You can search Mercy Worship. Church Worship. Yeah. That is so hard to say. Mercy search Church Mercy Worship. Church. Can you say that five times? Yes. Yeah, search fast. Mercy Church. No, no, I search, 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 what I now? <laughs> but also, if you are wanting to more worship, we would love for you to come in person. Yes. Like, we would love to see you yes. come here, join us. We know the online service can be a really cool space to check out Mercy Church and see who we are and what yeah. we're about. But there is something totally different about being here in person, in person and just worshiping. And so, yeah, yeah hearing would, the voices of the saints sing together yeah. with your voice yep. and after service, getting to talk to someone, yes. getting prayed over, praying with someone, talking to someone, yes. hearing yes. stories, yes. seeing faces, are, actual faces, not on TV. There's they, so much. There is. There's yeah. a lot yes. more. But it's the it's things you can't even describe. Really yes. cool yes. to see yes. that. So we actually do have two campuses. Alan, why don't you tell them? One church, two campuses. One is at the Sugar Creek High Charter School. Is that Sugar how you say Creek, the Chatter yeah, High School? Sugar Creek High School. Sugar Creek High School. That's Chatter. right. That's right. S C C H S. That's yes. right. We got and it. And the other one is at Providence Road. Yep. And so at the Providence, we call it MPR. We have two services at yep. 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. Yep. And then at Northeast, we have one service the right 9 now. It's 9 a.m. Yep. So if you want to gather with us in person, would you please show up? We would love yep. to see you. If you see any of us, you see myself, Jessica, Noah, or <laughs> Jack, just say, what's up? We, we gather with you online. Yeah. We would love to introduce you to the rest of the Mercy family. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, before you guys get out of here, like we said, we do have some really exciting things coming up in the life of Mercy Church yes. that we want to tell you about. So first thing that's coming up is we have a DMT. DMT. What is DMT? It is a disciple <laughs> making team. team. So if you've mm. ever wondered, how do I make disciples? What would cross-cultural evangelism look, look like, like in the city of Charlotte? Yeah. What does spiritual multiplication look like in the real world? Yes. This is a 10 week training. And it's for you. If you've it been will asking change those questions. your life. It actually will change your and life. And change your neighborhood. Yeah. For real. That's so true. That's so true. So the teams are starting later in the year. Yes. There's actually an interest meeting today. But since you're watching online, you may not be able to make it in time in person. Yeah. So what you should do is go to mercycharlotte.com slash news. Look for the DMT graphic and click on the link there. That way 
our missions team will know that you are interested in doing Great. something like that. That's and awesome. they'll follow up with you. DMT. So yeah, the next thing we got to talk about, I'm going to let you talk about it because it's Mercy and I Real Vision oh, yes. Night. All right. So on the 15th, Saturday, this coming Saturday, we have the Mercy and I Real Vision Night. Woo, it's going it's to so be close. at uh, it's MP. So it's so soon. So, it's so it's soon. like Saturday. It is so <laughs> soon. Uh, from 7 p.m. It's going to be at the Providence Road Campus. So yes. please go online uh, to mercycharlotte.com forward slash news. news. <laughs> and then when you see the Mercy and I Real graphic, just yep. click on it or click on the RSVP link. Yep. We would love for you to go Go ahead and RSVP, RSVP your friends if yeah, you're coming just so, we know. so that we know and yeah. prepare. And it's it's going to be exciting. It you is. will hear what the Lord has laid in our hearts for the city of Nairobi, how we want to see the gospel awakening in Nairobi. Yep. Spread I'm, out I'm to the trying end not the- to cry. Okay. I'm not thinking about you leaving. It's fine. Guys, we, hey, we, still, we still have some days. We still have some, some days. Some days, we do. Oh, man. But yeah, so we what have exciting... What else do we have going on? Well, other than that, there are, we're not going to talk any more about yeah. events, but you can find out all the events at mercycharlotte.com slash news. But we know it's Sunday. We know you want to go spend some time with your family. Yes. And so we just want to say thank you for being here. We love that you were here with us. We hope that this service was an encouragement to you. And I think we should just send them out. All right. You want to do it? That's it. Mercy Church. Mercy Church. You are are sent. sent.